Thanks so much for joining us. So your role is Head of Digital Innovation and Design at RBS, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. So we'll ask about that in a minute, but I thought to begin with, we'll just throw you straight in at the deep end because you are a banker. And we'll ask you, you know, why do we need banks? You know, in five years time, why do I need a bank? Yeah, fantastic. And uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and, and I'm always reminded of that, that famous quote from Bill Gates, right? Where he says that banking is necessary, but banks aren't. And, and I'm very conscious of that, right? What, what, what people effectively want is the ability to kind of do money and do money well. Uh, and historically that required a bank, right? Because that was your only option. I think today we've seen this blurring line between, uh, between big techs and fintechs and banks. And actually what people want is just whatever help and support they can, where they can just, just do money easily and do it, do it very well. Um, that's, that's raised the game, I think, for, for banks. And we've seen a, a step change in terms of the, the service provision that we provide. Um, but, but in the future, right, customers are going to be pretty agnostic about who, who serves their needs. It's just got to be easy. It's just got to be good value and it's got to work in, in their interests. And if banks can get that right, then they'll still be here in the future. If not, somebody else will come in and provide that service instead. Yeah, and, and I know that banks are also starting to use different types of language. So they're talking about innovation. They're talking about startups. They're talking about digital transformation, seamless payments. So this might be a good opportunity to talk a little bit more about contextualizing your role. So head of digital innovation, but also design. What does that actually mean? And what are the layers of that? And, and what's your role with, within kind of the organization? Yeah, sure thing. So um, as the name sort of suggests, there are three different or constituent parts to, to my role. Uh, the, the first is kind of head of, uh, of digital is exactly that, right? I'm responsible for all of our customer facing digital channels. So online banking, mobile banking, uh, all of our websites, our corporate digital platform that we that we offer to corporate institutions, uh, and I guess I'm ultimately responsible for what is the what is the customer experience like using those channels. Uh, secondarily, I'm responsible for innovation, so that's kind of looking beyond our current service offering and trying to understand where the future is going. Look at disruptive technologies, uh, look at customer behaviors. And really start and think about what's the business model shift that the bank really needs to be focused on to make sure that we continue to be relevant a long way into the future. And a lot of that is um, how we work with, with fintechs and other partners uh, in order to really change our service offering. Uh, and then the third and final thing is, is design. Uh, and broadly, that's kind of technology architecture, right? How do we construct the bank from a technology perspective so that we can kind of keep, keep delivering in the here and now but also architect in such a way that it becomes easy for us to integrate and connect with both customers and third parties alike uh, so that we can start and deliver really uh, value added services to our customers in the future. Thanks for that summary. Um, it is really interesting listening to you talk because to some extent, banks are borrowing or have borrowed some of the language of Silicon Valley, talking about design thinking, you know, architecting, um, users. So, you know, for a, a huge organization like World Bank of Scotland, and it might be worth actually just giving a brief, you know, background into who World Bank of Scotland are and the corporate structure and all of that. But who are your competition today? Is it other banks or is it large platforms that might be um, integrating digital payments in the future? Yeah, sure, sure thing. So, so if I give a, a little bit of context, um, so, so, so Royal Bank of Scotland uh, started as, a, as an organization way back in the 1700s as a, as a small little regional bank, uh, and it, it grew to become briefly the world's biggest bank, the, right. the RBS group. Uh, and that's what it was when I joined it back in 2008 as a, uh, as a fresh-faced graduate. Um, what effectively happened was we then had the, the, the big global credit crunch, and actually RBS uh, as, a, as a banking group uh, rapidly started to, to right size and, and shrink from this kind of global behemoth that it had become and actually focus on uh, the core UK retail and corporate banking market. Uh, and we recently rebranded to call ourselves NatWest Group um, to better reflect the, the major brand that we serve the majority of our customers under. Mm -hmm. um, as we've kind of retrenched from our previous kind of global presence, 
it does make sense for us to still do business in certain international jurisdictions. And, and, and RBS International, which is the part of the bank that I'm in, does exactly that. So we sit outside of the UK ring fence and we're a full service bank, uh, but we, we, we provide kind of banking services to uh, international customers all the way from sort of you know, retail depositors through to small businesses, high net worth clients. The lion's share of what we do is in the, the kind of institutional uh, space. Uh, where we are a real specialist in, in funds banking and depository services, which is effectively providing independent oversight uh, for, 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 for fund investment activities. Um, so it's, you know, it's a great business to be part of, relatively complex, um, and with, with customers that have got very complicated, often multi-currency needs. Uh, but but you know my, my job is making sure that the bank continues to deliver both a great digital experience now and is looking to the future to ensure that we deliver uh, a relevant experience for them uh, well into the future. So, so what does that involve? Because I saw a, a quick video of you and you were talking about the kind of partnerships and, and entrepreneurs and, and inventors you wanted to work with. And you were talking about, um, you, you were kind of looking for um, three things. You were looking for people with an understanding of some of the technical problems banks like um, NatWest or World Bank of Scotland were facing. Um, evidence of how you can solve those problems, capability, and also a cultural fit. And I know there's three different things there, but of course, the, the cultural fit is also a really interesting one because you do have these kind of, you know, you've got the crypto and the fintech guys that sometimes haven't come from traditional banking, although in the UK, they often have. Um, and then you've also got the kind of legacy banks that are trying to adapt to this new um, reality, you know, some of these new payment systems going forward. So. In terms of kind of working on innovation, you know, who are you partnering with? Who do you meet with every day? What are the kind of conversations you're having? And, and how is culture changing within the bank? Yeah, so, so that's, a, again, a, a great question. Uh, and, and a lot of my time is spent kind of looking outside of the bank, right? Mm -hmm. So I will spend um, several hours a week having meetings and introductions with um, the latest new fintech solution provider, um, and, 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 and part of that is sometimes trying to work out the difference between like, where is a solution that's looking for a problem and where is something that's, that's, that's new that really is on the sweet spot in terms of it solves a pain point for our customers or for our business. Um, and so I guess, you know, whenever I, I have those interactions with fintechs, what I'm, what I'm looking for is that kind of evidence that, yeah, this is, this is a, a, a real problem solver. You know, this is not just kind of novel, novelty technology that's looking to try and have application, mm. but it actually addresses a need that our customers have. Mm. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of understanding and the relevance in terms of our business. The, the, the cultural fit really is about um, how well it aligns with what we're about as a, as a group. Um, fair, fair to say that I think in the past, banks perhaps lost their way temporarily, right? Where it all became about kind of maximizing profit and delivering shareholder value. And maybe sometimes that was at the expense of, of our customers. Um, banks have, have, have probably learned a very difficult lesson over the past decade. Um, and we recognize that actually look, the purpose of banks is to deliver value in the societies that you operate, right? And if you're, if you're not really enhancing the, the, the lives of the customers that you serve, then, then you have no right to be here and serve them. So, so the banking group that I represent is very clear about our purpose, right? We, we only exist to help businesses, people, families to really thrive. Uh, and, and they thrive by improving their financial literacy, improving their relationship with money, uh, and, and always giving them all the tools that they need to really go on and kind of build successful and, and balanced lives. Uh, and I guess what we're looking for is where technology helps us to do that. Um, every, every day, the thing that I'm focused on is like, does, does, what we're, does what we're delivering to customers really help them to go on and achieve their ambitions? Does it help you know, in, in, in improve their financial life? Does it help them build their business? Does it help them you know, meet all of their aspirations? If it does, great, we're interested. If it's about like, how does it help the bank make a quick buck? That's, that's just not the market that we're in. That's interesting. And um, kind of one side of that is also the, you know, this discussion on digital transformation, which is happening across industries but it seems to be happening in banking at a very fast pace as well. So over the past 12 to 18 months, how has COVID-19 kind of affected some of these things 
you've been talking about, how you think about pain points, how you think about how the ways of the customer, be it an individual or small business, have changed. Has that influenced your role in terms of innovation or strategy or thinking? Yeah, it's, it certainly has. So, so we had seen uh, probably over the past several years this gradual migration towards digital servicing, right? Um, once, once upon a time, banking was was a very face to face uh, kind of human to human interaction, right? You went into a branch, you saw a relationship manager. Um, that was the way that banking services were delivered. Uh, I think probably ever since 2007, 2008, we've started to see this this gradual but increasing move towards digital services. Uh, millennials like me, that's our that's our go to, right? Like my my first port of call to try and get something done is a digital channel. Uh, and only will I ever pick up the phone or have to go somewhere if I couldn't achieve it through that that channel. So that was that was something that was happening long before COVID. I think what we saw with the pandemic where suddenly we're all, you know, prisoners in our own home and couldn't go out people had to make that, that shift to digital services. And so we probably saw about four or five years worth of adoption activity in the space of a couple of months. Uh, and that, that shift has been permanent, right? Customers that have adopted digital channels during that period, they're never going back. They're not you know, waiting for the time when they can go and queue in a branch again. You know, they're, they're in those channels. Um, I think what, we've, what we also saw during COVID though was the importance of maintaining that human element in banking mm -hmm. if you think about you know pre-pandemic you had people that you know had a had a viable job going in that lost it almost overnight had a viable business and suddenly that that business wasn't viable anymore and these people were you know panicked about how am i going to pay my mortgage how am i going to you know continue to uh feed my family in in some instances and and digital only service providers really struggled to deliver the support that their customers needed at that time. Yeah. Uh, and so I think for, for us, COVID has been this, this almost light bulb moment around, you know, yes, we're gonna continue to enhance our digital services and be a, a digital first bank. However, that cannot be at the expense of still being a human centric organization. And actually in those moments that really matter in customers' lives, they need to know that they're not dealing with a kind of a faceless uh, mm -hmm. digital interface, but actually there's, there's real people at the other end of that and that they can have meaningful dialogue with a company that understands them, that empathizes with them and will move mountains in order to kind of deliver the services that they, they need. And so, you know, we eat as much as, you know, my role is focused on delivering great digital experiences. Um, underlying all of that is still delivering the, the, the human uh, empathetic part of the bank where we can connect with customers on a, on a person to person level and deliver the support and help that they really need. Yeah. So, I mean, that um, what you said about, you know, adoption during COVID-19, five years of adoption within the space of that, that's, that's fascinating. But there is also underlying this discussion on kind of values and empathy, particularly during COVID-19, which, which, which makes total sense. Um, given some of the situations you describe, uh, again going back to this issue of trust. So you know you, you you mentioned you're a millennial and and you've grown up during an interesting time because some people have grown up using platforms like you know Facebook or Google, and it's arguable, but many people use these platforms every day and, and they they trust them, they're familiar with them, and at the same time there's a generation that that's grown up with the banks and you know I'd say particularly for the younger generation who grew up during the crisis um there's, there's an image problem and there is an empathy problem and there's also a there's even aspects of entrepreneurship you know if you want to be an entrepreneur kind of 10 years ago you go into digital you go online because doing anything bricks and mortar or working with kind of legacy traditional institutions be, be it you know uh, banks or that kind of things was so difficult and it does seem like if banks want to compete, if, want to, if they want to move into this arena, some of the language you're using is actually really important. You know, um, having that kind of relationship that new digital banks might not be able to have, being able to talk to uh, someone at the other end of the bank, but also having digital services that a new generation are familiar with. How is that? I mean, do you think that transition is possible? Because obviously there's two arguments. You've got the blockchain guys, some of the crypto guys, some of the fintech guys, uh, some real intellectuals saying this isn't possible. You know, there's a historical revolution taking place. 
even if it was possibly possible, there's a lot of people that want to use these other systems. Or do you think from where you're sitting, you know, banks are transitioning, they do get it. They realize that the digital economy is going to be so big that they have a massive opportunity to play a role within it. And the future is going to be much more hybrid, where, you know, as you're kind of hinting at, banks do, banks perform like platforms, but also do have the kind of trust to some extent with money and with regulations that the existing banking system used to have. I don't know if that's very well summarized, but I think you can see what I'm trying to get at. In the yeah, I, I, there's a disconnect between the, the image pre 2008 and what happened post 2008. And you've got these two systems that seem to be conflicting to some extent. And we're all trying to work out which direction it's going to go in. Yeah, no, I, I definitely get where you're, um, where you're going with that, that question. And it's something that, um, banking as an industry is very cognizant of, right? So, so I think, you know, pre, pre the fintech boom, if we call it that, um, banks positions were relatively safeguarded, right? Because there wasn't a whole lot of choice in the banking marketplace. You know, there's maybe four or five big banks in the UK and it was a relatively closed market. And, you know, people just accepted that they had to, at some point as they kind of matured from childhood through to adulthood, go and open a bank account. That was like one of the key moments in life of, I need to just pick one of these four or five, open a bank account, and then I'm kind of wedded to it for, for life. Uh, and in fact, there's interesting statistics around, you know, you, you are more likely to, to, to change your spouse than you are your banking provider, That's right? Cool. It's, that, it's that kind of just permanent <laughs> yeah. relationship, right? <laughs> so, um, so, so, so I think, you know, up, up, in, up until what I'll call recent times, banks have kind of, had that privileged position of like we we can't be disrupted mm. um suddenly we've had this emergence of you know fintechs and neo banks and challenger banks and 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 you know the, the playing field has, has has opened up significantly and now suddenly you know consumers are faced with this well i don't necessarily need to bank with a traditional bank or maybe not even a bank at all right like you know there's any number of e-money providers where i can just i can have my money sat on a on a digital service somewhere and i can get to it when i want to and you know you've referenced a couple of, of platforms that that the younger generation have probably got more familiarity and confidence in than they do these kind of banks that their parents had a relationship with but doesn't mean anything to me uh, i mean i don't know if you can see the picture on the on the wall there but like so so my young kids are growing up in an environment where things like Alexa are just like part of the family, right? It's mm -hmm. always been a voice in the kitchen that they can talk to. Um, you know, the, the, the platforms that they will become familiar with and conversant with uh, and, and start and, and, and want to talk to about money uh, are fundamentally different, right? It will be a Alexa, I, I need some money so I can book a holiday. And, and if you're not in that channel, then kind of game's over, right? So, so the bank is starting to recognize we need to be in the channels where customers are. Uh, and we already see in other parts of the world, things like WeChat, where it's you know, becoming the super app, right? That, that customers never need to leave. It's where they do their communication. It's where they book their travel and entertainment. And it's where they, they do their money. Mm. Um, we, we recognize that actually that's the way that people are changing, right? There is this blurring, um, blurring lines between like, what is, what is my lifestyle? What is my money? What is my kind of social network? It's all gonna converge. Uh, and that's why it's so important that the bank is architecting in such a way and partnering in such a way that we can seamlessly be where the customer needs us to be. Um, I, I'm under no illusion that like banking isn't something that people look forward to doing, right? But there's absolutely none of our customers that get up in the morning and are like, today's the day I'm going to do my banking, you know, goody, I can't wait. Um, the reality is that like it, it shouldn't be a visible part of people's lives, right? Money, money, unfortunately, is something that a lot of us don't have a great relationship with um, and, and is a cause of anxiety and stress. But actually, what, what the bank should be looking to do is help people to kind of get their relationship with money in a good place so that they don't have to worry about it, so that it's kind of being taken care of. And you can get on with living a human centered life, doing the things that you want to do because someone's got your back in, on, on the money front. And I think that's what we're trying to move our services towards is you know, really intelligent use of, our, of AI um, so that we're, we're working constantly on a customer's behalf, you know, giving you the prompts when you need prompts to take action, but otherwise like trying to give you that peace of mind that 
that money is being taken care of and you can just go and focus on things that really matter to you. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed. That's where we want to take our services. Um, I think, you know, maintaining customer trust will be fundamental to that um, and making sure that we design in such a way that we can work seamlessly with our you know, partners and uh, kind of non-bank participants to really deliver banking in the, in the channels where customers want us to be. No, thanks for that summary. So it definitely seems that the banks are very aware and probably have quite smart response based on, on, on some of the arguments you've just put forward to the cultural and historical issues and platform-based issues, as well as the technical issues. Um, but, but going on to the technical issues, because you mentioned WeChat, and you know there has been this discussion on the size of digital payments in China, you know, predating the launch of the digital yuan, and how much transactions, the scale of the transactions taking place there across digital devices. And I noticed that, that one of the things all of the banks are looking at, from, from banks such as RBS to, to challenger banks, is you know minimizing the, the amount of friction on a payment system, which I think is, is how you put it in one video. So, you know, I know you're looking at um, digital solutions. I think you mentioned at one point that that you know physical cards might at some point go away. So we're not just living in a cashless society, we're living in, in a sort of cardless society. Why do you think payments and frictionless payment and, and seamless payment is, is really important for, for all banks, um, you know, from, from emerging fintechs to large organizations such as RBS? Yeah, so, so whether, it's, whether it's banking or whether it's anything, any other part of our life, right? No, nobody wants complexity. Nobody wants a process to be difficult, right? Like I just want to be able to get to my solution and do it as easily as possible. When it comes to money though, I need to have the assurance that it's safe and not just anybody can kind of pay money away from my account. Um, and this is the real great opportunity that digital gives us, particularly in the payment space, because it allows us to make the process kind of frictionless and easy for the customer, but then probably more secure than it's ever been, um, right? Like you, you'll be familiar with kind of two-factor or three-factor type authentication, right? Um, and there are different levels within that. There's kind of something that the that the customer knows, like a PIN or a password, something that the customer has, that might be kind of a soft token or a card and a card reader, and then something that the customer is, right? Their, their face, their fingerprint. Um, and obviously uh, the most secure of those is something that you are. It's much harder for me to kind of replicate a, you know, a, a facial structure or a fingerprint than it is for me to kind of guess a four digit PIN. And so, um, you know, the real opportunity for, for, for banks is to, is to leverage things like you know, biometrics that now, now exist and are now commonplace to make it easy and seamless for you, the consumer, but far more secure for you as well. Uh, and I guess that's where, that's where we're going in the payment space. Um, if, I, if I come back to, to your, your kind of pre, pre-statement b- before the question around this kind of, you know, this exponential growth of the platform providers, the WeChats, the Googles, the Amazons, all these kind of platforms that are, that are growing and growing exponentially, um, they're on the fringes of financial services mm. uh, while kind of regulation is probably catching up. And I think that's why we're still seeing that banks have got this pivotal role at the moment in terms of kind of partnering and being the accessibility for the bigger platforms into the banking space. Um, you know, even though you know Amazon's, Google's, Facebooks are gradually acquiring banking licenses, I think they're still at the point where they're looking at what is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world mm. and going, this is not our area of expertise. Our area of expertise is providing great digital experiences. And so what you're starting to see is kind of partnering with banks who are very experienced in terms of navigating this complex regulation. And I think going forward, that's, that's potentially a, a model that will continue to work, right? It's who can, who can partner the best, not who can kind of outcompete somebody else, um, but, but playing to your strengths within this marketplace uh, and, and, and meeting the need that, that, that you can. Um, and at the same time, you know, we'll wait and see how, how regulation continues to develop. I think, you know, banking regulation is still probably behind where the technology is at the moment. Uh, and so we're seeing this period of catch up as our regulators really start and get, get comfortable around the technology that now exists and allowing us to use it to its, its maximum effect. Yeah. So the regulatory thing is, is interesting because of course, when, you know, you pick up the economist and you read about what's happening in parts of China or India. And it's, as you said, clearly the technology exists. 
Um, so, so there must be lots of concerns about its rollout and things like that. But again, APIs, um, which probably 10 years ago weren't being discussed that much in banks. I know they're becoming central to a lot of what's happening here in the UAE, um, but they're also being mentioned a lot in the UK. And we did talk about partnership um, between different kinds of organizations. So, I mean, how are you working with APIs and, and how does uh, RBS kind of experiment and test uh, API solutions? Yeah, so, so we are rapidly becoming what I would call a, a bank of APIs. Uh, and, and we recognize that like, we will compete going forward based on the openness and accessibility of our infrastructure, right? The banks that will kind of, kind of win and still be here in the long term will be the banks that were the quickest to open up and become really easy and seamless to connect with. Um, so we are absolutely prioritizing the development of our, of our suite of APIs that make it easy for fintech providers and even our clients to kind of directly integrate with us, right? As you, as you move up from kind of the retail space and into the, the large corporate and institutional space, um, you, you hit upon banking clients who have got you know, their own systems uh, and they're, they're multi-banked and they will always be multi-banked. And what they really want is a way of being able to kind of aggregate all of their banking services, connect it seamlessly with accounting software and other, other bits and pieces. And how easy you are to connect with is fundamental in terms of how competitive you are in that space. Uh, and so, you know, we are investing heavily in making sure that we've got readily accessible APIs and also that we're well equipped to make use of other participants' APIs and deliver, you know, additional uh, value added services to our customers seamlessly. Yeah, so I mean, it is interesting because I was, before I was in the UAE, I was living in a mainly cash-based society in, in Jordan. And I remember going back to the UK and feeling kind of like someone from the Stone Age because one of my friends paid with her, paid with her iPhone. I was like, what, you know, what the, this was, this was some years ago, to be fair, but I was like, what the hell was that? You know, and as you said, you know, you've got the identity thing on the iPhone. So that's kind of a layer of security, which arguably makes it more secure than paying with your card. And then you must, I don't know how it works, but there must be some API or something that connects through to your bank or your card and processes that through. But what was interesting about, about that for me was the, the layered aspect of the technology and that somehow, you know, the, the biometrics or the identity-based system on your phone was giving you access to Apple Pay. Apple Pay was somehow connected to your bank and your bank was somehow, you know, paying for that pizza or whatever it was. And even that for me was kind of interesting because the idea of, of doing that on my phone was relatively new. And, you know, yesterday um, we, we had a discussion with Brett King, who suggested that's just going to accelerate. He gave a hypothetical argument that, you know, you could walk in with your AR, AR, AR glasses in five years time and pay for a coffee without doing very much at all. Um, is that kind of one of the holy grails for banks as well, that kind of, you know, seamless um, identity place payment system? And will that be API based or are banks also looking at things like the blockchain? Yeah, so it's so, a so great, great question. And, and again, if I just kind of re rewind slightly, um, this, this probably points to that cultural shift in the bank where we recognize that the best way to deliver innovation is through partnership, right? So in order to kind of deliver that seamless pay on your phone experience, there are a number of participants that make that possible. Historically, I think, you know, banks would have had that siloed mentality around we don't want to work with anybody else. Like, how do we deliver all of that end to end? Um, and the reality is that, like, going forward, banks cannot be silos. You know, it's not it's not a castle that you build walls around. Mm -hmm. Instead, you are kind of a, a tree in a big interconnected ecosystem, right? And you will only thrive in that system through connection. Uh, so, so we get that, and it's in the customer's best interest as well because it delivers experiences like the one that you outlined. Um, Absolutely love Brett King in terms of his kind of future focus and you know whether it's whether it's Google Glasses, whether it's an embedded chip in our bodies. Like I I don't I don't know where the future goes, and I'll leave it to people like him. I think uh, for for the bank because that future is somewhat uncertain. Like we nobody nobody could predict that COVID was coming, and nobody can predict exactly where we're going to be in five years time. So instead, what you've got to build is the capability that allows you to adapt and flex irrespective of what the future starts to look like. And that's where it's so important that we build that kind of openness in our architecture so that we can connect with, with any partner. 
so that we can embed ourselves into any kind of device, uh, whether it's you know Google Glass or wh whatever that that future thing might be. Um, I personally think mobiles will be will be around for for a while. I think it will be a, a little time before we kind of make the leap from a separate device into something that's embedded. Uh, but I'm not I'm not saying it's never going to happen. Um, you know, the mobile phone has already become the extension of our of our physical self, right? Like absolutely, I haven't touched money for 18 months, right? All of my transactions are done via mobile. Mm -hmm. um, I carry digital ID kind of on my on my mobile phone. I think that that will continue to be the future. You know, people are far more likely to change their physical address than they are an email address or a phone number. Like these things are almost things that become yours for life now. Uh, and so at some point soon, we will make that transition to like, that becomes your indisputable digital ID and you'll release that to people as you want to. Uh, and all of these kind of friction processes that are you know, KYC and physical passports and all that kind of stuff will, will start to disappear in favor of kind of undisputable digital identities that are, that are linked purely to you. Yeah, that is kind of fascinating. Yeah, I mean, um, that, that kind of role of digital identity and all of that seems to be accelerating incredibly fast all around the world. Um, but just to, to kind of end on a more cerebral note, so we had a call with a, a banker in Europe, uh, Mr. Pedro Pinto, who was talking about the kind of fintech ecosystem in the EU and was saying, look, one, one of our problems is you have potentially networks like Facebook with 2.8 billion customers. Regard, let's, let's think of it as, as any platform with you know, upwards of 100 million customers. And were they to start launching payment solutions they would potentially have access to cross-border transactions that are very difficult for European banks. European banks have KYCs. You know, despite open banking, we have different regulations in almost every single European member state. And he basically argued that this is one of the, the greatest challenges holding banks back, jurisdictional laws, the role of the nation state, and, and how do you compete against that when you know, the future of finance is moving into the cloud, is moving online, is moving into networks with, with you know, far more people than any single nation state. Now, you guys are based, you know, you're saying that, that historically you're concentrating more on the UK market now, but what about internationalization? What about moving um, these services, you know, outside of the UK? Are, are banks still, or the banking system still siloed within nation states? And is this a discussion that people have or is this a discussion that is still some way off because because when you see the world from cyberspace rather than from the banking institution it seems to be you know a, a kind of longer time but, but really serious issue yeah so so it's a it's a great question and and something that certainly all banks are wrestling with and um and, and the one that i work for uh, is, is is very active in this space right as you think about these kind of global platforms with global reach um, and their ability to really seamlessly move money across borders. Um, like that's, that's kind of a hitting on a historic place where banks used to make a lot of revenue, right? In cross-border transactions. Uh, and all of that is kind of on a race towards zero now because it should be real-time settlement that costs nobody nothing. Um, so, so the best bet for banks is not to try and fight against that tide, but in fact, figure out a way to kind of surf those waves, right? And, and, and it's not about competing, it's about, well, how do, you, how do you really form an essential part within this mix? Um, and it goes back to probably one of the things that I hit on earlier around, um, you know, the, the, the skill set of the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Googles is, is not navigating payment regulation, right? It's about providing the digital experience and the digital capability. Uh, and in fact, you know, the opportunity is not to compete, but to partner and for banks to start and really leverage their strength and experience of we have relationships with these regulators. We have a strong track record of being able to navigate this kind of complexity. Uh, and so I think what we're going to continue to see is an increase in terms of partnerships and we'll start and see business model shift. In, in what banks do, right? It won't, it won't be, you know, we, we generate a lot of revenue from net interest margin and uh, interchange fees and cross-border transaction fees like that, that will all start and minimize. And instead kind of, you know, banking as a service, whether that's access to payment rails, payment schemes, whether it's access to 
kind of regulatory guidance and support, like that will start and become the future business model for banks is, is being facilitators within, within this space rather than end-to-end -end providers of everything. Mm, that makes total sense. And there's some historical analogies with, with what was going on in Venice and other parts of Europe many centuries ago in terms of bank and trade um, with what you just said there. Um, but but I guess it's you know as you as you said at the start of this call while banks are changing banking isn't going anywhere. Um, so thanks a lot for your time today, Jamie, and hope to see you in Dubai uh, later this year in October. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you, and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, hopefully continuing the conversation there.